Well, welcome to everybody. It is a really, real great privilege, as always, to have you here at Bible Study today on this Wednesday morning in Pretoria, South Africa. I know you might be listening or watching this recording at a different time in a different place. And just a great welcome to the ladies in Cape Town and in the south of Johannesburg and the ladies in Texas who join us. And I know we've got some ladies in New Zealand, in Australia, and Ireland. Welcome to every single one of you, wherever you are listening or watching. It is really always a great privilege to have you here with us during this time of study. It's time to study the Word, ladies. This is a good time of the day. It's a good time of the week. It's the time of the week, as, I, as you know by now, you hear me say this every single week, it is by far my highlight. This is a highlight for, me, for my week. It's a time of my, my week where, where I really long for, I look forward to, and when it's time to study God's Word with you, it is incredibly exciting. So thank you for being here. We are going to be getting into some spiritual boot camp. Hey, that's what we do when we study the Word. It's really a bit of a spiritual boot camp. We don't just look at the Word. We don't just browse through the Word. We study the Word of God. Now, I don't know how you might be feeling. Maybe you might be feeling a little bit lethargic this morning, maybe a little bit tired. Maybe you're feeling a little bit burnt out. Anyone? Anyone feeling a little bit burnt out? Maybe you're feeling plain fed up. Maybe you're just like, you know what? I'm just fed up, just totally fed up. And maybe you're feeling like you're wanting to give up. Hey, does any of, do any of you ever feel that way or is it just me? Hey, do any of you sometimes maybe feel you just, I'm just so fed up right now. Well, if you're feeling anything like that, this is the best place to be because when we get into God's word, it is a perfect way to get us back into shape. What God's word says in Hebrews 4 verse 12, his word is alive, it is active, it is sharper than a two-edged sword. And when God's word comes into you and when we study God's word and we start living according to God's word, it just brings the most remarkable life into our bodies and into our spirits and into our souls. So let's get started. How do we start every week? We start with our anchor scripture. For those of you who are joining us for the first time or listening for the first time, we have an anchor scripture every year. And the purpose of the anchor scripture is my whole mission behind that is even if you only remember this one scripture for the whole year, that is fantastic because when God's word comes into you, even if it is just one part of God's word, that in itself will bring life to you. So wherever you're watching, however you're joining, let's do the anchor scripture together. It is found in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5. Please remember to put your microphones on mute if you can, ladies. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, and say it with me wherever you're watching. Every word of God is flawless and he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Every word of God, every part of God's word, ladies, all 66 books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, all 31,102 verses in God's word, every part of God's word is flawless. And as women of word, as Bible study women, as women of God, we choose to believe it. Yes, we choose to believe it. We choose to take God's word as our truth. It is our anchor. It's what grants us. It is our reality. No matter what is happening around us, no matter how crazy things are around us, we choose to believe God's word. So we are studying the armor of God. And today is already the sixth session. So if you've missed any of the previous sessions... I really would love to encourage you to try to get an opportunity to listen to the previous um, five sessions. And um, it's really just going to build a really great foundation for you. And every week we grow and every week we build on it. But today we are moving into session number six. But I'm going to do a little bit of a recap because it's good. It's good to recap. It's good for me to recap. And I'm sure it's good for you also to, to recap. Now, the question that, that faced me when I started with the study of the armor of God is, why do we need it? Why do we need the armor of God? We know according to God's word that the enemy is defeated, right? That's what God's word says. In Hebrews 2 verse 14, it says the enemy is defeated. He is a defeated foe. So if he is defeated, why do we need the armor? Why has God given us the armor? Well, that tells me quite clearly that there is a battle that is raging, 
I'm sure every single one of you can agree, wherever you are at, at the moment in your life, there is a battle that is raging. There is a spiritual battle that is raging. We must not be naive to think that the enemy is just lying down even though he is defeated. Not a chance. John 10.10 10 says the enemy's mission is to come to kill, steal, and destroy from you. That is, that is his 24-hour-a-day mission. Now, we don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. That is not something that we want to hear, that there is a very real enemy, the devil, who is out to destroy me. I don't like to hear that. But God knew about that. He knew. He knows the devil. He's like, don't worry, my beautiful children. I am going to give you everything that you need in order to stand. I'm going to give you everything that you need in order to live. Everything that you need to live is a matter of fact, according to what Jesus says, he came to give you life and life in abundance. And God says, I'm going to give everything that you need for that. And the armor of God is just that. So we've got a spiritual enemy, which means we need spiritual weapons. Now, can I please just reiterate, the devil is defeated. Don't you all just want to just say that to yourself? The devil is defeated. He is defeated. He is a defeated foe. In Colossians 2 verse 15, we read there that when Jesus died and he rose again, he stripped the enemy of all his power, of all his weapons, and he made a public humiliation of the devil. He is completely, utterly defeated. He is a defeated foe. Luke 10, Luke 10 verse 19, which is one of my favorite scriptures, we read there what the, what the Word of God says, that God has given you all authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. And you know what I like to add in there? Cockroaches, right? Because that's what I call the demons, they cockroaches. God has given you all authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. And over all the power of, in, of the enemy, God has given you authority, does that just like register in your spirit? Does that just like sink in and go, oh my word, yes, there's a very real battle, but my God has given me the authority to trample on the devil's head. When we study the, 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 the shoes of peace in the last session, we saw that, that God has given us the authority to trample on the devil's head. He is under your feet, ladies. He's not our level with you. He's not allowed to be our level with you. He is defeated. Praise God for that. We thank the Lord that Jesus has already done the work, but we have to appropriate it. We have to stand. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Can you hear the noise now? I'm sure you must be able to hear it. Just nod your head if you can hear it. Can you hear the outside noise? Not? Well, thank the Lord for that. He must be protecting all of you and protecting this broadcast. It is loud. So if I land up shouting... <laughs> I apologize. It is so loud at the moment. I, I, it sounds like I'm in a war zone. Quite appropriate for the study, isn't it? <laughs> okay, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Let me recap a little bit with you. Finally, my brethren, finally, my sisters, hey girls, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That was session one, very quickly. Be strong in the Lord. That strong comes from the Greek word dunamis, which means explosive supernatural strength that God has deposited inside each one of us through his Holy Spirit. And in the power of his might, that power is the Greek word kratos, which means that it's the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. Ephesians 1 verse 19 to 20. The same power power, the same power. I, I, I keep on reminding myself and I keep on reminding you about this. The same power, ladies, that rose Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. Like what? Yes, that's what the word of God says. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. God backs the strength. God backs the power with his own might. Isn't that remarkable? That was session one that we did. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God. Did you notice the put? It's an action. It's something that you've got to do. 
You know, you've, you've, you can't just think that the armor is just going to be there. The word here is telling you, you've got to put it on. It's an action that you've got to do. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Some translations say, say against the devil's strategies or against the devil's wiles. The, the terrible thing here that we studied in session two, we saw the enemy has a very specific strategy to hurt you. A very specific strategy. He watches you. He studies you. He knows what's going to trip you up. He knows that maybe a temptation that might tempt me will not necessarily tempt you. So he's not going to tempt you with the same temptation. No, he knows you. He knows me. He studies us. We saw that in session two. He knows what is going to cause you to fall. He knows what's going to cause you to explode. He knows what's going to cause you to bring, get, get into fear. So he brings those, those tests and those challenges and those trials your direction because he knows you. He studies you. Verse 12, for our struggle or our wrestle or our battle, some translations say, is not against flesh and blood. And I always say at this point, your struggle and your fight is not with your husband. Your struggle and fight is not with your ex-husband or with your mother-in-law or with your boss or with your pastor or with your child. That is not where your battle lies, ladies. We saw this in session two when we studied it. But your fight is against the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness and all spiritual wickedness. That's where the battle lies. That's where we need to stand firm. Let's move on to verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. When Paul was writing this to the Ephesians about over 2,000 years ago, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it, when he said, when the day of evil comes, they may have thought that they were in the day of evil, but I believe he was talking to you and I. We are certainly in the day of evil. Are you reading about or, and watching what's going on in Afghanistan at the moment? Are you seeing what's going on around the world at the moment? This global pandemic that we are in, never mind that, all the other strife and unrest, we are in the day of evil. But the word says, when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand. Now that standing, that action, is so powerful. We saw when we studied in Exodus when the Israelites were leaving Egypt and they, they, were, they were being set free and going to the promised land and they came to the Red Sea and the Egyptians, the, this fierce army was chasing them down. God tells Moses to tell the people to stand still. Wow. The battle is the Lord. Stand still. That's what, what God told uh, Moses to tell, tell the Egyptians. Now, the same message is coming to you and I through Paul, written to the Ephesians. Once you've done this, stand. Stand. That's what the word of God says. So now we get to verse 14. Stand firm then with, now we get into the parts of the armor of God, with the belt of of truth. We studied that in session three. The belt of truth is God's word. Because in a world when we are so confused as to what is true, what is truth? Who decides? Who decides the standard? Who decides what is true and what isn't true? Do governments decide it? Do politicians decide it? Do school teachers decide it? Do rock stars make the decision? Do social celebrities and influencers decide? What is true? No, we can't possibly look at any of those people. The, the thing, well, the place where we go to look at truth is God's word. God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It will remain forever. When the grass fades away and the earth fades away, God's word will still remain. God's word is truth. God's word is our truth. And the belt of truth is exactly that. And when we studied in session three, we saw the belt of truth gives you your identity and it gives you your authority. It makes you walk different. It makes you talk different. It makes you sound different. And the enemy is petrified of it because when the word of God, the rhema word of God comes in, into activation in your life, that is truth. It makes no difference what you're feeling around you. That is true. Belt of truth. Then it moves on to the breastplate of righteousness. And I, and I suggested to you that there were two types of righteousness. And I explained that in session four by saying you get positional righteousness, which means that when you become born again, 
when you give your life to the Lord, instantly, amazingly, this miracle happens. And the miracle is that you are declared righteous. You are made righteous. You are repositioned from being an orphan to being a child of God, from being a slave to being an heir with Christ. There's a repositioning that takes place there, which is positional righteousness. But then why does God's word say, put on the breastplate of righteousness? What I believe and what I suggest on that is it's referring to practical righteousness. 1 John chapter 3, 7 to 9 talks about the fact that you've got to practice righteousness. The Greek for that is praso, praso righteousness. Make it your habit habitually, every day, regularly. Make it part of what you do. Practice doing God's word. Practice doing what's right. That is the breastplate of righteousness. Then we moved on to the shoes of peace. And I love the shoes of peace because they're so misinterpreted. Many people think that they are just these peaceful shoes, but in actual fact, they are killer shoes. It's actually a weapon. It, it does defend you, but it also is an offensive weapon, the, ki the killer shoes, the shoes of the gospel of peace. And what's the gospel? The good news that when you strap yourself up with God's peace or Jesus himself, peace reigns in your life no matter what battle you are facing, no matter what terrain you are walking in, no matter what windy weather and terrible rainstorms and enemy that is that you're trampling on the the the, the, hohos, the cockroaches that try to come your direction, God has given you all authority to stand and trample on them. That was the killer shoes. Now we are moving on to the next part of the armor of God. Let's read it. Ephesians chapter uh, 6 verse 16 we're getting to. Here it says, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. The King James Version says it really beautifully. I love it. It says, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So what is faith? What is faith? Before we look at the shield, let's talk about faith. As, as believers, as children of God, we all should know what faith is. The very fact that you are a child of God means that you exercised faith because you have faith in God. But what does faith mean? Let me have a sip of coffee while you think about that. Ah, good coffee. What is faith? The dictionary definition of faith is complete trust, complete trust or confidence in something or someone. Complete trust. Now just think, just think about that. You know, so often we read something and our eyes just browse over it. Think about that. Having complete trust, total trust, 100% trust in something or someone. So who are we supposed to have complete trust and confidence in? God. God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, His Word. We are supposed to have complete trust and confidence and faith in God's word. Complete, 100% complete. Now you might say, yo, that's very difficult. That's very, yeah, there's certain parts of God's word that I can fully believe. But yeah, the whole, every word of God is flawless. The whole word, I must believe the whole word of God. Well, let me ask you this question. Each one of you are now sitting at the moment on a chair. I think no one's standing. Most of you are sitting. When you sat down on that chair, did you question whether the chair can hold you up? Did you? Did you stop and look at that chair and go, hmm, you know what? I've picked up a couple of pounds or kilograms over the last lockdown period. I'm not so sure this chair can hold me up anymore. Did any of you question the strength of the chair that you are sitting on? Anyone? Can I just see a show of hands? Nobody. How remarkable. Every single one of you put your faith in an inanimate object. Yes, you did. You, you didn't sit on that chair and go, oh, oh my goodness, I don't know if it's going to hold me up. Oh my goodness, I know that the manufacturer says I can, I can sit on it, but I don't know if I can fully trust it. Maybe I'll just sit lightly. I'm going to sit on one bum cheek. I'm not going to put my full weight on it. Just half a bum cheek. 
No, just in case. None of you went and looked underneath your chair to see if it was strong enough. None of you went to go read the guide to make sure that it can hold your weight. Did any of you do that? Of course we didn't. You see, you put your trust and your confidence in, in things all the time, in inanimate objects. When you climb into an airplane, you trust the, air, the, the pilot that he will be able to fly you from one place to the other without even meeting him. Do any of you first say, before I climb on this airplane, please, I would like to meet the pilot. I would like to see his credentials. I'd like to see where he studied. I want to know how many hours he's flown for. I want to know what his personal life is, that he's not having any struggles at home. I want to make sure that he's not on any, no any narcotics because I can't trust him if I don't know. Do any of you do that? Well, of course not. None of you do that. Why is it that you trust the pilot to fly the airplane? It's because you trust his authority. Now, last year we did a study on faith and on trust, and maybe I should do that again one day with all of us. But in that study, I mentioned this, that I, when I went and asked, I said to the Lord, why is it that we battle to trust you? I'm going to sneeze. Oh, no. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. <laughs> that was funny. That was strange. Okay. Why is it that we battle to trust God? And God gave me this. He said to me, because my people do not know my character and they do not trust my authority. Hmm. Sure. Let that penny drop. When you battle to trust God, when you battle to trust the word of God, it means that you do not know him and you do not trust his authority. Sure. Yes, I can hear someone's got their microphone on and they're going, sure, thank you, that's true, sure. <laughs> that's the fact. Because when you have complete trust and confidence in someone, you do not question whether they can do what they say they can do. When you go to a surge, have surgery and you have to get your body cut open by a surgeon, you might have a 10-minute consultation with them before they do that but yet you go and put your life in the hands of a, of a man or a woman that you do not even know. You see the sign on their door that says doctor, so you trust them. But yet we have our God, the Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth, almighty, majestic, powerful God, who's given us his word, who's given us his spirit, who's given us Jesus, that sent Jesus to die for us on the cross of Calvary, who died and rose again for us. He's done all of this for us. And then we still go, oh, is it true? Mm, I don't know if I can believe that. Yeah, I don't know, hey? Mm, yeah. We question God's word all the time. We question him all the time. We only do that because we do not recognize his authority. And when you have faith, when you have complete trust and confidence in God's word, in God's word, that is what we're talking about here, the shield of faith. Faith. So now let's have a look at the shield. Now remember, we, when we study the armor of God, we're looking at it in the context of the Roman soldiers. When, when Paul wrote the, the book of Ephesians to the Ephesians, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he, he used this as an analogy because the people of the time understood how fierce the Roman army was. They were the most fierce, powerful army of the time. They were a very strong, formidable army. So he compares the armor of God to our spiritual armory. Remember, Paul, he was, Jew, he was born, Jewish, but he became a Roman citizen, and he could also speak Greek. So he had this whole context. This was part of his life. So when he writes the Ephesians and he writes the armor of God, this is why we study it in the context of it being the Roman armor, okay, just so that you understand that, because there's different types of armory in different types of, with different armies, but we are studying the Roman, sol the Roman soldiers. So let's look at the context of the shield. What did the Roman soldier's shield look like? It was called, in Greek, it was called the therios, T-H-U-R-E-O-S, therios. And what it looked like, it looked like an oblong door. It was very long. It would be able to cover the whole length of the soldier from top to bottom, and it looked like a, basically like a door. It basically covered the soldier completely. It covered them totally, the whole part of the soldier. In every situation, they were basically 
covered. Now, when we have a look at faith, and I'm going to be doing the analogy the whole time, when we have a look at faith, when we've got faith operating in our life, it covers us completely. It covers us in all situations, for every circumstance, whether it applies to your marriage or to your children or to your finances or to your career or to your health or whatever it might be, it is a complete cover because that's what the shield of faith does. That's what the shield did for the Roman soldiers. It was also very, very heavy. They say around about 10 kilograms in weight, a very, very heavy shield, and it was strong and it was incredibly durable. It had multiple layers. Some, some of the studies say that the shield would go up to six layers of animal hide, which was leather, that it was interwoven with each other to form this very strong, very tough piece of the weapon, piece of the armor. Now, interestingly enough, what I find quite interesting, in the front of the shield, right in the middle, there was a knob. There was a knob right in, in the front of it. And some people suggested that it was decorative, but other scholars say that it was actually part of their defense. So it was part of their, 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 um, their attack. When the enemy would come, they would use that knob to knock. It was like a fist on the front of the shield that would knock the, the enemy out. So it was quite interesting, and I'm going to bring that into application shortly. Now, very interesting about the, the shield itself, that the Roman soldier's shield, because of all the different layers of animal hide, it could become very, very stiff. Now, if any of you have any leather furniture or a leather handbag or a pair of leather shoes, you will know that over time, if the leather is not looked after, what happens to the leather? It starts to crack. It starts to become not as strong as it was before. There can be like little, little holes that can form in it, and it just basically doesn't fulfill its optimal function. So the soldiers would have to take care of their shields. What I saw is that it seems like the soldiers would have a daily routine that they would actually maintain their shields. A daily routine that they would have to maintain their shields. Now, let's just bring this back to God's word. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says that every single one of us have been given the measure of faith. Now, some translations will say a measure. I don't know if you've read that before, that you've been given a measure of faith, and then there are some people that say, well, because of that, I have more faith than you do, or you have more faith than she does, because we all have a different a measure. But the original translation in Romans 12 verse 3 says we've all been given the measure of faith. And when you further study that, I don't have time to go into that now, but when you further study the the measure of faith means you and I have the same faith that Jesus had. Huh? Imagine that. Imagine that. We haven't just got a measure, we've got the measure. As a matter of fact, you've got more than enough. You've got more than enough. There's another scripture in Luke 17, 6, that you know, you'll know the scripture well when I say it, that if you have the faith, the size of a mustard seed, you can say unto this mountain, be, be rooted up and be removed. The size of a mustard seed. Do you know how tiny a mustard seed is? So you might say, well, Tracy, you've got so much more faith than me, which is not true because we've all been given the measure. But even if your hypothesis was true, which it's not, but even if it was true, all you need is the faith the size of a mustard seed. Like that's tiny, incy wincy teeny weeny, like tiny. I don't know if you've seen a mustard seed, it's so small. But you have more than enough. So these soldiers had to take care of their shields. They had to look after them. So they had a daily routine. What they would do is they would rub a small vial of oil over their shields. They would rub it, rub it, rub it all over. Rub it, rub it, rub it with the oil that would penetrate into the shield because that would maintain the, the leather. All the different layers of, of, of leather from the animal hide, it would maintain that. Now, how does this apply to us? Romans 10 verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. So as you are hearing the word and you're hearing the word and you're hearing the word, you are upkeeping and maintaining your faith. 
you can't go on yesterday's revelation. You can't go on last year's revelation. You can't go on the revelation that you received when you became born again 40 years ago. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word. There's another scripture, I think it's in Galatians 3 verse 2. I think I've written it somewhere. Let me just go read it quickly. Galatians, Ephesians. I just want to go back because it's a great scripture. Let me just get there. I like the scripture. Whoops. Um, also Paul writing, says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. So now he's talking to a group of people that saw Jesus being crucified. He said, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Oh, I love Paul. When you read the way he writes, he's actually, I think he's like my type of person. You know, you've witnessed this, but I just want to hear one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by observing the law? No. Or are, did you receive the Spirit by believing what you heard? You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word, and hearing and hearing the Word, and hearing and believing the Word, and hearing and believing the Word. Are you getting what I'm saying here? The Roman soldiers had to do it every day. Every day they had to maintain their shields. Every day they had to make sure that their shields were ready for battle. They didn't wait till they got into battle and went, Oh my goodness me, I better start maintaining my shield. Nah. -uh. They did it before they went into battle. Every single day they were doing it. Every single day they were making sure, sure that their shields were battle ready. You and I, every single day, we need to be making sure that our faith is battle ready. We've got to be doing it. We can't go on yesterday's revelation, ladies. We can't. We can't. We have to make sure it's a daily thing, part of our life. If we don't do it, it will start showing cracks cracks will start appearing. They won't have the same durability. It won't have the same strength that you were used to maybe 10 years ago. You might be saying, well, I felt that I had more faith 10 years ago than I do now. May I suggest that that could possibly be the reason because you have stopped hearing and hearing and hearing and believing and believing and hearing and hearing. We've got to maintain it all the time. Our faith needs that upkeep. Let's move on to the next part of the scripture. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to quench. This phrase, he shall be able to. Oh, I loved it when I saw this. He shall be able to in the Greek means this. Dunamis. Ah, you all know what dunamis means, session one. He shall be able to actually in the Greek is dunamis which is showing us that take up the shield of faith and then you become supernaturally strengthened and explosive strength comes within you through faith so that you can quench the fiery darts of the enemy. We're going to get to that part now. But dunamis, a shield of faith dynamically empowers us dynamically empowers us. And when you live by this faith, it shocks the enemy to bits. And that's where I see the knob on the front of the shield coming in. Remember I spoke about that knob, which is like a fist in the front of the shield like this, that kind of like stunned the enemy. When you live by faith, it stuns the enemy. It shocks him. He's like, oh my goodness, guys, talking to his fellow uh, brethren, the cockroach, speaking to those guys, and he says, guys, you know, I've, I've been trying to strategize and I'm trying to find, we're trying to find a way here to destroy Tracy and trying to break her down, but she just keeps believing. What is going on here? How is it that she keeps on believing? We're throwing this at her, we're throwing that at her, we're bringing this her way, and she keeps on believing. Your faith shocks the enemy, your faith stuns the enemy. It literally punches him in his nose. <laughs> I'm very visual, as you know that. I, I get these visuals in my, in my head and, and I see when I believe God, when I shouldn't believe him because of circumstances, I get this picture like I'm giving the, the enemy a bit of a, you know, like, a kudoof, kudoof, like just getting him a little bit of a smack across his face. I enjoy that vision. There's no biblical context for that, people. It's just my interpretation. Okay, let's move on. Rick Renner, who's one of my favorite Bible study teachers, as you know, he writes this about the shield of faith. He says, the shield of faith is so powerful that it makes you fortified, invulnerable, and armed to the teeth. It equips you to hold an ironclad position. It turns you into a spiritual tank, baby. 
I added the baby. He didn't say that. He turns you into a spiritual tank. When you've got the shield of faith operating in your life, you become like a spiritual tank, not just a little person that's covered with a little armor. No, you become ironclad like a spiritual tank. So you have the ability to move your position forward without taking any losses yourself. This doesn't mean that the devil won't try to stop you. Of course he's going to try to stop you. Of course, it's his mandate, it's his job, that's what he does, 24 hours a day. But when the shield of faith is held out in front of you as it ought to be, you become divinely empowered. You become di divinely empowered. You know, there's this, this, the word empowered is used in so many different contexts now, nowadays for different groups of people, different people, you know, whatever, different organizations. Empowered. The best type of empowerment that you can receive, my friend, is being divinely empowered by God himself. Dunamas. Divinely empowered. To do what? To quench the fiery darts of the enemy. The word quench comes from the Greek sabenumi. I'm saying it wrong, I know. S-B-E-N-N-U-M-I. Sabenumi. And what this word basically means is put out by water. Put out by water. So what the soldiers would do just before they went into battle, they would take their shields that are now battle ready and they would soak them in water so that when the fiery darts would come, it would quench the fire. It would literally stop it in its tracks. It's, it's a, also a, a, a lovely imagery that I get here. Now, when I think of this, I think of a scripture in Ephesians chapter 5, Galatians. Let's go up to, back to Gal uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, talking about the husband and wife relationship, comparing it to Christ and the church. But it says, I'm going to read from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a whole nother topic, whole nother day, different study. Oh, yes, I think we should do it 100%. Yeah, let's move on. Verse 26, six, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Through the word. When we are washed by the word, or should I say when we read the word and read the word and hear the word and believe the word and hear the word and believe the word, we are being washed by the watering of the word. And as we are being washed by the watering of the word, that is getting us ready to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. You know, there is absolutely nothing that can stand against God's word. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. John chapter 1, verse 1, this was our, our first anchor scripture two years ago. They said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The, the, the Word of God has been here since the beginning, and the Word of God is Jesus, by the way. Jesus on paper. Like, if you want to know who Jesus is, read the Word of God. Hebrews 4, verse 12, I've quoted that a little while ago. The Word of God is alive. The Word of God is active. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Two-edged comes from the Greek word didastamos, which means two-mouthed. That's also a different study, but it basically means when you come into agreement, when your mouth comes into agreement with the word of God, that's when it becomes a two-edged sword. Nothing can stand against God's word. Psalm 138 verse 2 says, God places his word above his very name. Wow. Wow. God places his word above his authority. This settles the question of many people say, well, surely God can just stop that evil person in his tracks. Yes, of course God can. God has the authority to do it. But God places his word above that, which means that in God's word, there's a couple of principles put down in place. And one of them is free choice. Free choice. God can never go against a person's free will, ever. God can never go against a person's free will. He instituted that back in Genesis chapter 1. He gave man free will. He gave man free choice. Even though he's got the authority to go against your free will, he never will because God places his word above his own authority. God places his word above his own name. 
It's pretty remarkable. Isaiah 40 verse 8, I quoted the scripture a while ago, that the grass might wither and the earth might fade away, but God's word will stand and remain forever and ever and ever and ever. God's word will stand forever. There is nothing that can stand against God's word. And when you are washed in the water of God's word, when it's something that you are drenched in and soaked in, you are able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. What are the fiery darts? The fiery darts comes from the Greek word belos, B-E-L-O-S, belos. And basically what the fiery dart looked like in the Roman context from the enemy, it looked like a very simple little arrow at first sight. It kind of looked a little bit like, hmm, that doesn't look that scary. But what it was, it was an arrow roughly about so big, and it was covered in flammable liquid. But what made it worse is on the inside of the arrow, it was hollow. It was, it was hollow on the inside, and then the enemy would actually fill the inside of this arrow with flammable liquid. So it would make the arrow like a mini bomb. That's what the belos is. That's the, that's the arrow that Paul is talking about in this context. So it was like a mini bomb that the enemy would use. So often at first, the, the arrow looked inconsequential. It didn't look like, oh my goodness me, look at my armor. I'm so like geared to the teeth. There's no way this little arrow is going to have any difference. It's not going to make any difference on me. However, when the bomb strikes... When this mini inconsequential bomb comes and hits the heart and the emotions of a person and sets aflame the, the, um, the human passions with inside of you, which is related to your flesh, which is related to things that cause a person to sin, then it can cause damage. That's why we need to have our shield of faith up so that our shield of faith can quench the fiery darts that come your way. We can't be naive, ladies, and think that those little inconsequential things are not going to make a difference. Let me give you a couple of examples. You might be overseeing the petty cash in your company or in, a, in, in your church. You might be the church treasurer or whatever it might be. And you might be overseeing the petty cash and you're checking out the little petty cash box and you think, oh my goodness, you know, I really need a little bit of lunch money. What is that right there? That's a temptation. That's an inconsequential. It seems inconsequential, but that's a little fiery dart that's coming your way. But if your shield of faith is up, you will know automatically, no, 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 this is not what God wants me to do according to his word. One of the works of the flesh, one of the, one of the sins of the flesh is stealing and thievery and all of that. You will immediately know that I'm putting my shield of faith up. This is not going to attack me. I'm not going to allow this to come my direction. What about getting Getting offended. You know, I'm just so sick of this person right now. I just never ever want to see them again. I don't want to talk to them. I, I, if I, I, I'm not going to answer their messages. I'm, I'm just not interested. And you think it's harmless. But do you realize that that could possibly be, be a fiery dart? Is it possibly a fiery dart that the enemy is sending your way? But if you've got your shield of faith up and you've been washed by the water of the word, it will be able to quench that before it can even hit your heart, before it can even get root in your heart as an offense, before it can even get root in your heart as, as a form of rejection. Here's another one. I just jotted some ideas down. Oh, it's just a friendly text from another ma man who's not my husband. It's just a friendly text. Oi. <laughs> Inconsequential. It's nothing hard about it. There's nothing bad about it. It's just that I'm just being friendly, man. I'm just being friendly. I'm, I'm showing the love of Jesus, right? Isn't it amazing how we can justify things? right? We can justify things so quickly, but when you've been washed with the water of the word and the word of God is in you and your shield of faith is up, you will be able to recognize immediately that that is a fiery dart and it will immediately be able to be quenched before it gets rooted into your, rooted into your heart as a form of lust and ultimately lead to adultery. Sure, but Tracy, that's a bit intense. True, adultery doesn't just happen. <laughs> <laughs> contrary to what people think, it doesn't just happen. It starts off with fiery darts. It starts off with mini bombs that seem inconsequential, that seem innocent. So the shield, 
The word of God, the shield of the shield of faith is our first line of defense against the bombs that the enemy sends our way. And when we are soaked in God's word, it cancels out the surprise attacks that the enemy tries to bring us, those unexpected things that come our direction. It, it cancels that out. Will the enemy still try to attack you even when your shield of faith is up? Of of course he will. <laughs> Is he going to walk past you and go, oh my goodness me, Tracy Shields up, let's just leave her alone today. No ways, man. He is going to still try. He's still going to be on a mission. He will still be trying to bring offense in your life and rejection and fear and stress and disease and whatever. But when God's word, the shield of faith is up and operational, you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. I'm going to give you a very, very practical example. I heard a testimony this week from a lady. We, we were filming for one of our clients and um, there was a, a lady that, that uh, came to his ministry and asked him for prayer and because her son was very ill. And so I'm just going to give you the short version of it. Her, this lady, her son was 13 years old. This happened now in January this year. And he was, he just started getting sick and they couldn't figure out what was going on at first. And eventually they discovered that he had multiple bleeds on the brain, multiple bleeds on the brain. And he had tumors and he needed brain surgery and he needed this and he needed that. It really was not looking good. Never mind the exorbitant hospital bills that, that was facing her. And she never had medical, medical aid. Her and her husband had lost their jobs last year because of COVID. It was looking dire straight. Her son had the surgeries. It, it, it really wasn't looking good. He needed another one. And then she said, God's word took root in her heart. And the doctors came to her, a group of doctors were standing around her and said, it's not looking good. We don't think that your son will wake up. If he does wake up, he's not going to be able to walk and talk. He's probably going to have some serious problems. He's not going to recognize you, et cetera, et cetera. And she said, doctors, thank you for your opinion. I respect you as doctors. I recognize the fact that you are doctors in your field and that you are good at what you do. But my God said that my son will walk out this hospital and my son will be well. That's what God's word says. I am holding up my shield of faith in this moment, irrespective of what your group of doctors are saying to me about my child. I know what my God said. That next week, Tuesday, he walks out the hospital. He's alive. He's well. He goes to Afi's boys. Hi. <laughs> I in, we interviewed him on Monday. A remarkable young boy who's now 14 years old. He should not be alive. He's still got a tumor on the inside of him that the doctors want to operate on. And the mom says, my God said, it is done. My God said, he is healed. My God said... What is that mom doing in that moment? Oh, is she, being, is she being unwise? No. Did her son have the surgeries? Yes, he had one or two. But then her God said, your son will live. She chose in that moment to hear the word, believe the word, hold up her shield of faith and say, I hear what you are saying, doctors, but my God's word trumps what you are saying. My God is greater than what you are saying. And her son is alive. Isn't that remarkable? That's a real testimony that just happened a few months ago. He's a living, breathing, walking miracle, this young boy. Oh, but that can maybe only happen for some people. No! Why her and not you? She has a tenacity of faith that she refuses to believe anything except what her God says. That is holding up the shield of faith. When the fiery darts come and they say, oh, there's another tumor. Oh, the kidneys are failing. Oh, this is happening. That's a fiery dart. And she keeps her shield of faith up and she says, but my God says. When they say, you've got a hospital bill of almost two million rand to pay. She says, I hear what you're saying. I will sign on the dotted line. I have no idea how I'm going to pay it. But my God says. Do you know that every single part of her hospital bill was covered in full? in full, by people that some people, she doesn't even know them. Her hospital bill was fully covered, fully covered. That is what it's like when you live with your shield of faith up and in operation. 
My final thoughts about this, about the shield of faith. We are all soldiers in God's army. We are all warriors. We all are, you know, geared up with our armor, fully equipped when you choose to put on the full armor of God. But we are part of an army. We are part of the army of God. Now, what the Roman soldiers did when they were coming into a position when they were about to face a very formidable enemy, a very scary enemy, a very, and maybe an enemy that appeared to be more powerful than they would, they would get into a specific formation that was called the tetsudu, or otherwise known as the tortoise. I'm sure you all know exactly what I'm talking about. It's when the Roman soldiers would interlock their shields in with one another, and it would form like a, like a, a, like a barricade. You know what I'm talking about. I'm sure you've seen the movies. I'm sure you've seen the pictures. That was called, it's called a tetsudu. It's a, it's a barrier. So what the soldiers would do, they'd come right in next to one another. They would put their big oblong shields up next to each other, and they would interlock them like this. They would interlock their shields, and this tetsudu was so strong and so powerful that they said that even if um, men could run over the top of it, even horses could run over it, and dependent on the way that it was formed, they say that even chariots would be able to ride over the top of this tortoise, over the tetsudu, and it would not harm the soldiers. Isn't that remarkable? That's what the Roman soldiers would do. Now, how do we apply that to us? You know, sometimes we cannot stand on our own. Sometimes you might be feeling, wow, (laughs) I'm just feeling a little bit fed up right now. Like I said right at the beginning and the start of the study. Might be feeling like you just want to give up. Feel like fed up, I'm tired, it's over. Just feel (laughs) pleh. At a time like that, that, my friend, is when you need to interlock your shield with another woman of faith or another person of faith. You need to interlock your shield, just like the Roman soldiers did. We need to, as the army of God, not just be in our own little battles, in our own little world, but realize that everybody is in some form of battle. And maybe what we should all start doing is interlocking our shields in with one another and realize as one person, I am a really strong, formidable, according to Luke 10 verse 19, praise God for that. But can you imagine if we are all doing it together, if we are all interlocking our shields in together, can you imagine how much more power powerful we are, how much stronger we are when we interlock our shields in with each other. We literally become unstoppable. The reason I'm saying that is I think that especially in this time that we are in, when people are becoming familiar with isolation, when people are becoming familiar with being alone, when people are becoming comfortable with doing things on our own, not gathering together, not seeing each other, not being face to face, not being in worship services, we are getting used to standing on our own. Now, in some ways, that's good because some of us need to learn how to stand on our own. But in other ways, it's dangerous. In other ways, we need to re- actually realize when something happens in our lives and that we are in a in position where we just feel plain fed up and you just feel like you can't anymore, that's when you need to interlock your shield. Also, what I saw with the soldiers and even in other armies, what they would do, they would fight back to back. They would stand back to back like this. My back here, another, another soldier there with their back, back to back, and they would fight like this. They would stand like that, so they would be able to see the enemy coming from all directions. Ladies, we are not in this alone. You are not in this alone. You are not. We are all part of the army of God. And if you feel like you are alone and you feel like you just don't have anybody to stand with you, please contact us. If you don't have a church, if you don't have a friend, if you don't have a husband, if you don't have anyone that you feel that can really support you in this, contact us. Contact Leanne, contact me, contact Yolandi. Maybe we should start some type of a prayer thing. I know the Cape Town ladies do that. Yolandi shares that with me, which is really beautiful, that the Cape Town ladies have have a good prayer support for one another. Maybe that's something that we should start doing because we are not meant to stand alone. We are not meant to fight alone. We are not meant to do life alone. We are not meant to do that. If your husband is a believing man of God, filled with the Spirit of God, get on board with him. Let your prayers come into agreement with each other. Every time you pray by faith, do you realize you are interlocking your shields? 
Do you realize that's what you are doing? It's not just a nighttime prayer. Lord Jesus, bless us. Thank you for our children. Thank you for our grandchildren. Thank you for that. No, it's not just a nighttime prayer. It's not just a morning prayer. It's not just a prayer for your meal. For goodness sake, every time you pray and you put your faith attached to something, you are interlocking your shields with that person. Whether you're praying with your child or your parents or your husband or a friend or whoever, we are interlocking shields. And we're putting our shields together and we are fighting by faith. Standing by faith. So faith is complete trust and complete confidence in our God. I want to read one more scripture, Psalm 112, verse 6 and 7. Psalm 112, getting there, getting there, still getting there. Verse 6 to 7. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in God. You see, when you trust God, your heart will stay steadfast. When you have faith in God, your heart will stay steadfast. Verse 8, his heart is secure. He will have no fear. In the end, he will look in triumph on his foes. <laughs> Doesn't that just someone make you feel lacquer for the American ladies? Doesn't that just make you feel delightful? Oh, no, hang on, that's British. The American ladies, you can come up with your own interpretation. Doesn't that just sort of make you feel lacquer? There's no other nice way of saying that in South Africa. It just makes me feel good that I will be able to look in triumph at my defeated foes for the person whose heart trusts God, for the person who has their shield of faith up, complete trust, complete confidence in your Lord, in his word, putting the shield of faith in operation in your life. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this time in your word. It has been such a blessed time, Father. We bless your word and we thank you, Father, for giving us this weapon that we can put into our hands. We thank you, Father, that you have given each and every single one of us as your children the measure of faith. We thank you, Father, that this faith, even if we might think it is small as a mustard seed, that this faith is strong enough and more powerful enough, that it empowers us, that it dunamuses us, it gives us supernatural power, Father, in order to stand firm. And I thank you, Lord, that irrespective of what the enemy might try to throw at me or try to throw at these beautiful women or try to bring any one of our ways, Father, we thank you that according to your word, when our shield of faith is in operation, when we are believing what you are saying, when we are trusting what, what, you are, what, you are, what you say, Father, bigger and more powerful than anything else that comes our way, when we believe it, Lord, it will quench the fiery darts that the enemy sends our way. Every fiery dart, every accusation, every rejection, fear, illness, disease, no matter what the enemy brings our way, it will be annihilated, it will be quenched, it will be destroyed. And we thank you, Father, that according to your word, that the enemy is under our feet. We, he is under our feet. Luke 10, 19, we thank you, Father, that you have given us all authority to stand on snakes and scorpions and nothing will harm us, even if it looks like it will harm us. It will not harm us in Jesus' name. So I pray, Father, and I ask you, Lord, to help us, Holy Spirit, to teach us, to guide us, show us how to hold up our shield of faith in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the trial, no matter what we are facing. I thank you, Lord, that as we hear your word and hear your word and hear your word and believe your word, that our shields of faith are going to be standing strongly in front of us as the first line of defense in our lives. And we thank you, God, for a supernatural breakthrough in every single one of our lives that are trusting you for something incredible, Father. We thank you, Lord, for, for, for us to start seeing these testimonies come into reality. That it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit, Lord. That we are able to believe you, that we'll be able to rest in you. And Lord, we want to actually just declare that in every one of our hearts. Don't you ladies want to just declare that in your hearts if you agree with me and say, Lord, I trust you. Don't you just want to say that if you agree with me? Lord, I trust you. I trust your word. I have full confidence in you, Lord. I have full confidence in your word. It's a done deal, Lord. It's a settled matter. And I pray, Father, that this word will become deeply rooted in each one of our spirits and in our souls. 
and it will bring life. It will bring life. I speak life over every person listening. Life into the bodies, life into the mind, life into the spirits, life into relationships, life into marriages, life into children, life into careers, into dreams. I speak life into every one of those areas by faith. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen.